Good morning, uh, everybody. My name is Stanislav Dalek. I'm CTO of uh, Cloudfero. I would like to welcome you to this uh, webinar. Today, we will be talking about uh, building efficient uh, cloud platforms for uh, processing uh, big uh, Earth observation data. Uh, we have together with us uh, Michael Schmidt from DLR, who is um, who is uh, one of the uh, our uh, core uh, customers and users of such platforms. And uh, Michael will be um, uh, talking about the implementation of the Code DE platform that uh, we have built together with uh, DLR. And we have, uh, I have also my uh, colleague, uh, Alexander Cesas, who uh, was a uh, project manager on, on this uh, project and on several other uh, big EO data platform projects that we have uh, built. First, a few words about our company. Cloudfero is a, is a uh, cloud service provider specialized in building uh, and operating uh, platforms platforms for Earth observation uh, data. So uh, today we will be sharing uh, our best practices and uh, our uh, uh, findings that we have uh, elaborated during the build-up of platforms for um, DLR, which is called the CODE platform, for ESA, which is the CreoDIAS platform that we operate, uh, and for uh, UMETSAT, uh, which is the uh, Wikio DIAS platform. So, uh, so uh, as for the agenda, first we will discuss, uh, I will talk about the different uh, challenges that we uh, face during the build-up uh, of these platforms. It will be uh, mostly um, uh, technical uh, challenges. Uh, then uh, Michael uh, will uh, follow with uh, uh, the customer point of view and uh, how it looks from the perspective of a, uh, of a customer uh, for whom we implement such a platform and for, for whom we operate such a platform. Then uh, Alex Cesar will be talking uh, about uh, how it looks uh, from the project manager's uh, point of view about uh, the implementation model architecture of the platform and uh, the key platform elements. We'll wrap up with a short summary and uh, end with a Q&A session. So uh, when uh, we face the task of building a cloud platform uh, for Earth observation, uh, we first uh, uh, think about the challenges uh, that uh, need to be uh, addressed. So, uh, first, uh, why? First of all, why do we need uh, an EO data platform? Uh, there are uh, several reasons driving this uh, this need. Uh, mostly, there is a lot of data, yes. Earth observation uh, is uh, one of the massive uh, big data uh, problems uh, nowadays. Uh, we are talking about terabytes of data being downloaded uh, each day. We are talking about petabytes of data to be managed. Then on top of this, when you, when you have uh, satellite data, most of, most of the time you have several institutions who uh, need to use and process this data. And these are different institutions who have different needs, who have uh, their common need is that they need uh, to process uh, these different sets of uh, data in an efficient manner. One of the findings fr from uh, both our own studies and uh, some external da data we, we came up to says that users spend uh, like typical uh, users who process your data spend 80% of their time downloading and preparing the data for processing, not doing the actual processing, not doing the actual science, not doing uh, the ex actual exploration of this data. 80% of the effort is spent on um, downloading and uh, acquiring data, 
uh, and uh, putting it into a shape that is uh, convenient for uh, for the processing. So uh, one way to and the, the way to uh, address these kinds of problems is to have a, a common platform, a big data platform that has a large common repository that puts the data in uh, at the user's uh, fingertips and to have processing close to this data. Okay. So uh, we talked about the uh, about uh, the why now uh, about the users of, of such platforms. Uh, so there are many different user groups, and each of these user groups have uh, has a di slightly different needs for uh, from such a platform. So we have uh, we have um, satellite operators, we have uh, public administration, we have industry. There are different user groups. Uh, their uh, their needs is uh, that first of all they need the data. They need multiple data sets, both optical. Most of the time they need to cross. Uh, you need to uh, cross data from different sources to do something useful with this. So. Different uh, data sets are needed. Current data is needed, so uh, most of the time, uh, timeliness is uh, important about the data. The data needs to be searchable. You need to uh, be able to easily select the data you need from this uh, sea of, uh, of uh, data. Uh, and you want this data to be available locally so that you can avoid downloading this uh, Data. Then you need uh, you need uh, easy access uh, methods. Uh, most of the users, uh, the heavy users, uh, need APIs to access this data. But uh, more casual uh, users and users need need visual tools uh, to access the data. The common ground for all this is that users don't want to wait for downloading the data. They need the data at their fingertips. Then you need the once you have the data, you have access to it, you need uh, you, you need uh, infrastructure to process this data. And here the needs of the user are uh, mostly uh, expressed in terms of uh, in terms of flexibility. Some users want to run uh, virtual machines. Some users even want to run physical uh, machines. Some uh, most users Nowadays, want to run, uh, have their applications packaged in containers, so they want to run Docker, Kubernetes, and the uh, uh, the container uh, orchestration uh, engines. Uh, some uh, the, the new trend is, uh, and the new kid on the block is uh, uh, is uh, function as a service. So users don't want to. Uh, take care of infrastructure at all. They just want to have their algorithm or their function applied to a large data set quickly and in parallel. So th this is a uh, function as a service uh, that, that is becoming a, another another popular um, uh, way of exploring the, uh, the data. Then uh, users mostly want to use their uh, very often their own tools, their own processing chains uh, that they have uh, built uh, over uh, very often uh, a very long period. They have invested in them and they want to run these at scale close to the data and the platform needs to be flexible enough to uh, provide this. Okay, then users need tools and integration and very often uh, the, the tools need to be integrated so that they are easy to uh, access and then they need multi-tenancy and billing. Uh, if you have questions along the way, you can ask them on the chat. We have a colleague who answers chat questions and we will be answering these at the, at the end uh, during the Q&I part. Uh, uh, okay, so now what a typical uh, EO data platform looks like. Uh, there is uh, data ingestion. Uh, so data is ingested from uh, satellite uh, repositories, from sat satellite data sources. So there is this ingestion and acquisition 
part. The, then there is the storage part. This is the data repository and catalog. This is the part that stores the data. Uh, and then there is uh, the processing part where uh, the data is uh, being processed. Uh, now, when uh, we build such a platform, there are several uh, challenges that need to be addressed. Uh, I will be talking about just a few of these challenges, huge data sizes, how to acquire store efficiently uh, data, uh, which is huge. Then there is data access, flexible functionality, ease of use, and scalability. So going to the meat of this presentation, huge data sizes. We have uh, several tens of terabytes of data flowing down every day. We have petabyte scale of the repository, how to uh, put together a platform uh, that is performant and that uh, is cost effective. So first, uh, we for data storage, we use a distributed replicated storage cluster. Uh, this is pretty standard no nowadays, but uh, this is the only uh, way to go. Uh, this, um, uh, we use, then we use uh, object storage, not file systems. Uh, since uh, this is a technology that scales much better, this is uh, uh, five systems have inherent limitations in terms of uh, scalability. Then uh, we don't have, uh, since the repository is huge uh, and uh, uh, the access pattern is mostly about accessing uh, large, uh, large data chunks, we need to optimize for uh, bandwidth, not for uh, IOPS. Uh, and generally, uh, we don't need extreme performance out of such a large repository, or at least performance per petabyte. So uh, we need uh, we need to optimize for uh, cost effectiveness, not necessarily for uh, very high uh, IOPS performance. Then at this scale, we need uh, several features from the repository. We need high availability. We need scrubbing of the data that because the repository is so large that disks uh, or any data carriers often break and the system needs to tolerate these breakages. So uh, it, it needs to detect problems and repair them uh, uh, automatically. Then for cost effectiveness, we, lead, we use low cost standard hardware, no, nothing very fancy, just the standard stuff you can buy from any uh, supplier. Uh, then we base uh, all our development on uh, open source software. This allows us uh, both, uh, th this is good for cost effectiveness, of course, but this allows us to, um, uh, to tweak and adapt this software very flexibly to our needs, which is uh, very important for this. Uh, and then we need provider-grade provider net networking. The best is to have a, su such a system placed in a carrier-neutral data center with a very high bandwidth. So this was about huge data sizes. Then data access. Uh, for data access, uh, uh, there are several patterns and several findings, uh, recommendations on how to uh, store this data to make it easily accessible. So uh, first we store the products unzipped. Uh, 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 NeoData product is usually composed of several files and uh, it is very convenient for users to be uh, able to access uh, every individual file directly without uncompressing it or even parts of that file. Then we uh, need to uh, provide different uh, access mechanisms. Some users want to use uh, uh, object interfaces. Some others uh, have le legacy uh, interfaces like NFS or SIPs. Uh, they want to access using a file system. And this is important for uh, legacy users, legacy apps. So, so it's important to provide different access uh, modes. Uh, then uh, the uh, data products need to be uh, provided in their or original 
form to end and to ensure traceability. U users need to know what data products, uh, what is within a data product and how it was obtained, whether uh, what was the parameterization. All these details are uh, important for uh, many users. Another um, criteria is the is to be able to provide tiled access to the data so uh, that users can access it with the uh, WMS, WMTS uh, interfaces. Uh, we do this by generating the tiles on the fly from, uh, uh, from the original data product. So th th this is uh, how we do it. And of course, we, we cache the recent, recent files. Uh, then uh, we need to provide a homogeneous catalog service uh, that allows users to uh, find the data easily and to provide this we provide interfaces to that catalog service both through the api and the web interface uh, then uh, we uh, uh, yes and and then we it is important to provide uh, events uh, that are able to trigger uh, processing uh, um, processing automatically uh, when new data arrives now moving on to functionality uh, users expect processing capabilities that are generally similar to what they find in the leading public clouds yes so uh, in order to provide it in uh, within a private cloud the only way to go is to use generally open source uh, because this is the uh, this uh, allows you to uh, be flexible to profit from the de developments of the open source of a large open source community and not to uh, not to put yourself and uh, your users uh, in the dependence of a closed uh, uh, system that uh, may be uh, that may be uh, difficult to uh, migrate uh, from and this also allows you to provide the functionality uh, uh, you need uh, at a reasonable uh, cost of course the need is, the system needs to be open flexible uh, upgradable uh, and what is really important is to provide the functionalities to users in a service form so that uh, the these functionalities are consumable as a service now ease of use uh, users uh, uh, users uh, uh, different users have very different needs some of them are very professional uh, IT uh, or data experts, some are uh, beginners. Uh, it is important to provide all the functionality in an easy to use uh, 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 way, which includes providing uh, access to the functionality through the API and the graphical interface to closely integrate different component, components. Many platforms for AO data processing are, um, uh, are uh, not, not well integrated and have uh, different um, access modes and different uh, uh, systems for storing data and for processing it. We try to integrate it uh, as closely as possible with, uh, with the common uh, uh, with a common uh, login system, with, with, a, with a common uh, um, uh, uh, with, with, with single sign-on uh, and a common uh, interface. Then uh, ease of use is, is also uh, being able to use the standards users know. So we uh, use uh, open standards uh, every, everywhere uh, where it is possible. It is important also to provide documentation and of course support for, for uh, the user. Support is extremely uh, important. Uh, many things uh, need to be explained to users and they, they often need this support part. Uh, and the last part of the challenges is about scalability. Uh, so users uh, uh, often have a, uh, an algorithm or a need uh, that is addressed by their 
software and the, they need the platform to apply this uh, software software at scale so in order to provide this scale um, uh, we need to uh, we have to follow uh, several recommendations one is to be able to uh, scale the separately the data cluster and the processing so this is uh, this is one thing uh, the other one is to avoid bottlenecks in storage and the data processing path. So when you scale the storage uh, to, to, uh, to uh, design an architecture that also scales the bandwidth uh, of access to the storage, not to have a bottleneck that uh, blocks this bandwidth. The other thing is to uh, provide standard uh, APIs uh, to automate pro uh, provisioning of the of the infrastructure so that users can uh, use their own tools to scale the uh, processing such, such tools as Terraform. Orchestrators are another another uh, type of um, of uh, frameworks that allow uh, easy scaling. So uh, the platform uh, should be able to run uh, things like Kubernetes, Mesos, or Swarm, or uh, other orchestrators, which allow uh, the processing to be easily uh, scaled. Uh, and uh, last, it is, it is nice to provide a Neo processing as a service functionality that, that allows uh, users to uh, uh, to process data at scale using either standard uh, processes provided by the platform or custom processes provided by uh, the customers themselves. So with this, uh, uh, th this would be the end of, uh, of the challenges uh, part. Uh, I, and I will uh, s switch the presentation to uh, Michael. Uh, Michael, please uh, uh, tell us about this, uh, about how it looks from the uh, customers, from the users' perspective. Yes, um, <clears throat> I'm happy to. Um, hello, uh, my name is Michael Schmidt. I'm from a German uh, space administration, DLR. We can hear you. Uh, Thank you. Can you hear me? Michael, we can hear you. You can or you can't? <laughs> Sorry, I assume everything's okay, so I start um, uh, talking. Um, we have Code.de as a platform, um, which uh, Cloudflare kindly um, implemented for us. Uh, we have a certain need. Um, the C in Code.de stands for Copernicus, so it's an access portal for um, Copernicus uh, data and information, and you see in the background image um, the um, the web presence that we have. Next, next slide, please. Um, Code DE is intended uh, to provide German uh, users, in particular authorities and research institutions, quick access um, to the Sentinel data and other satellite images, but also companies who, uh, who work for the authorities uh, and research institutions. CoGE is uh, part of the national strategy of the, of the German government. So it is a governmentally funded project. Sorry, I have to sneeze now, it's all right. Um, next slide, please. So we had specific needs um, for, for CoGE. Uh, one of which being uh, we need a national data access point for the Copernicus data as part of the European Collaborative Ground segment. Meaning um, we want to enable users to get a little bit quicker to the Copernicus data. Of course, users can go through the ESA hubs, but we wanted to have another national access point. So downloading um, is, is one thing that we wanted to provide, just sheer data distribution and a searchable catalog, of course. The other thing was um, we needed some capacities uh, for certain processes that um, are part of a public cloud, let's uh, say so, and we wanted to have a processing environment that is private and secure by virtual machines. We also wanted a training and support um, module 
and um, our time frame um, was a bit tight. We needed the project, uh, at least in the first version, up and running after six months, and then the full version after 12 months. And one of our key um, constraints was that we wanted to have the system um, in a user-friendly way, easy to use, intuitive with a modern look and feel. So we had a um, Code DE phase one project and we wanted to build um, from, from this and um, Cloud Ferro came in, in the, into a, a second phase of our project. Next slide, please. So there was a tender process involved um, and some of our requirements are listed um, on the left. We wanted the scale of the system. We heard about that before. We wanted uh, GPU access for um, artificial intelligence applications. We wanted a monitoring system. In terms of data, uh, we wanted to host uh, national mission data uh, from the German Space Agency, as well as uh, the Copernicus data itself, but also the have access to the Copernicus contributing missions. And we wanted some what we call convenience products, um, some data that are um, a little bit easier to digest for users. I'll show a few examples um, in a few slides. The system that we um, want to in, uh, wanted to implement with Code TE um, is free of charge. So we wanted a quota management system rather than a, a payment system. Um, inspire conformity for the data is, uh, is a, a requirement for us, but also very key is um, uh, to follow the BSI regulations for cloud security. BSI standing for the um, um, German uh, Data Security um, Authority. Uh, we needed a software management system and quality control a user management system, and we want continuously um, performance tests to be done on the system. And this is all part of the license prescriber, which is to the left, um, which Cloud Faro um, made an offer upon. Next slide, please. So you saw on the landing page on that front page from the website that we have designed um, three parts of the website. One is called data, one is called processing and the other one is help and support. Um, the website is bilingual, German and English. These are the, the German examples now. And I want to guide uh, through some of these aspects right now in, in the following slides. Next slide, please. So we heard before, um, we are in a big data environment here, especially when dealing with satellite images. Um, you all would have heard about the Copernicus program, that there's lots of satellites there, and there's more coming. Currently, I believe it's 150 terabyte of data globally. So there's another reason um, for the need for cloud computing. Next slide, please. And another big data set is the uh, Copernicus services, where we have six different services. Um, which are also quite data rich and they needed to be hosted and made accessible. Next slide, please. Then there's um, another component in terms of data. We have our user data and the BSI um, has certain regulations on it. And um, they were described in our license prescribal and Cloud Ferro came up with a neat solution um, saying that Code DE will be um, hosted in Frankfurt uh, in Germany with um, partial replication of the data in the Warsaw zone, essentially um, to do with the uh, ideas. And uh, with that set up, we were in a, in a good environment so that we can fulfill all our regulations. Next slide, please. In terms of the uh, data accessibility for the website, um, it, this is a similar setup that you will find in, in CreateDS, I believe. We have the data browser, where on the left side you see uh, the Sentinel data, one, two, three, five P. You have a few other data that um, are part of Code DE as well, um, like Landsat data and also uh, Korean land cover data. Um, all this data are part of the WMS service, so they're easy to browse and, and digest, and you can select in a convenient way different um, 
band combinations and uh, display options. So that makes the whole um, part of the intuitive user experience um, for us at least very good and we are quite happy with it. Next slide, please. Um, for Germany, um, so in terms of the data, sorry, uh, we have defined a little box around Germany where we want to hold all Copernicus data uh, for the entire uh, time period since uh, the collections began. And um, on top of that, we wanted, as I said, some convenience products. So we said explicitly we want Sensor 2 data, Maya processed. Uh, so that is one of the public processes. Another one is, is BOSS, a second collection um, of an atmospheric processor. Um, next click, please. There should be an image appearing. So this is um, a monthly composite of the um, Maya process atmospherically corrected images. This is level two wasp um, from an area, area around Berlin. Um, this is a convenience product that we wanted to have, this monthly composites, uh, which Cloudflare have implemented for us. Um, next slide is, uh, on next click, next image, um, is a monthly composite from uh, backscatter data from Sentinel-1, um, same area. So these are products that we wanted to provide the users for, for ease of use with. Next slide, please. Um, this is the finder for searching um, data and also, of course, to use it in your um, operational environment once you found the data with an API interface. Um, next click, please. Uh, we have organized the data in three different catalogs. One is the CoTE catalog. I roughly described it before in the, in the browser environment. To have access to global um, Sentinel images, we have the linkage to, to the Green Ideas repository and as a separate uh, collection, we have the Copernicus contributing missions, which can be downloaded um, from, from ESA itself. Next click, please. Within the CoTE catalog, for instance, you see um, there are the Sentinel imagery as well as uh, Copernicus DEM. Um, there are, there's a Terrace X catalog, the data itself are hosted in, uh, in Oberpfaffenhofen at, at DLR. We also have MODIS data available here as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in our portfolio on the website, we have a data description, nothing surprising there. So you should uh, or could look at that um, in the implementation of code DE. Next slide, please. Um, I mentioned that we needed a quota management system. So we have four different types of uh, users that we identified and four different types of, of quota um, that are managed through the help desk and um, then are enabling the user to use their virtual machines in, in the different um, flavors of an operating system. Next slide, please. Yeah. Um, processing, I just mentioned the uh, virtual machines already. Um, next click. Um, so virtual machines um, are, your, are the, the private environments for users. Users can upload their own data, develop their processes and routines and um, develop their, their products, which they can also then share through a WMS service um, with other people. Can you click further? And uh, this is just an, um, an LS, a listing of the of a Unix-based terminal. Um, the upper little window is the CoTE um, server, and uh, through another folder, the uh, lower image shows the data on the uh, Creators repository, which are visible to our CoTE users with a single sign-on mechanism, so you can write your own code, you can just um, adjust your folders and you can use the data. You may also see the um, Copernicus services there. The CLMS is locally hosted in Frankfurt, 
um, as we envisage that to be heavily used and the others are in, um, in Warsaw. Next slide, please. Just to show it, uh, we heard it before, Docker is installed. Uh, this is the hello world from the Docker um, world um, as implemented on Code.de and ready for our users to use. Next slide, please. And then we come pretty much to an, to an end. Um, another installation that we have, another interface for users to use and access the um, Copernicus data is the Jupyter Hub, where um, without a further login, other than the general CoTE login, users can explore the data through the, uh, the Jupyter Hub. Next click, please. Here's an example then of a bit of a longer script, um, how to display um, an NDVI image for a certain region. And the next slide should be my last one. Here's the website for, for CodeDE. And if you have any further questions, um, you can send me an email or um, we can do that in the discussion later on. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for this uh, for this uh, customer point of view. Uh, I think it was uh, extremely interesting. Uh, and uh, now I give the microphone to Alex as us. Okay. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Uh, you, you already uh, we have we have heard uh, what are the, the general or very specific in, in parts um, challenges and requirements for building a platform for for processing and storing cache observation data. We have heard um, uh, DLRs or German German authorities approach to to building such platforms. So what was important for for them and what we have delivered. And now I want to give you a very short insight on uh, how we went from a request for a, from a customer to the point where we had a running platform in six months, which was a, a big challenge for, for the whole team, uh, both in, uh, in DLR and, and Cloudflare. So uh, first of all, we, we, we had, uh, or DLR had a, a nice uh, and well-designed platform built in phase one, which, uh, which offered um, good web portal, uh, data browser, and the processing environment for to the users. It was operational, several thousand users registered and using, using that, but it had, slim, had its limitations, which we wanted together to overcome when building the phase two platform. So, when when we approach the project, we we set us some key design objectives. Apart from the objectives M Michel has mentioned as as uh, DLR's requirements, we we looked at what we have and, uh, and said that what you want to do is to maintain the functionality, so the so the users n are not thrown into a completely new world with nothing they could they were doing possible in the new platform. Second, we wanted to migrate the user base so the users can continue using the platform even though it's a, it's a new one. Next, we wanted to minimize the service interruption, meaning mostly the generation of the, of the convenience products and additional information that's available on the platform. Because the phase one platform was producing the data all the time and it was, it was, uh, it was um, required that once we switch over to the new platform, the data is available and the new data as, as, the, as the production from satellite is coming is also produced. Next was to modernize the system to use the, the uh, more recent um, technologies uh, because phase one was already a few years old. To <coughs> extend the availability of, of analysis ready data so the, so the data which is not raw Earth observation imagery, but something pre-processed with features extracted and indices calculated. To integrate it with the DSX, DSX ecosystem to make the best use of what has been already built by the Commission and, and ESA and make the, the design as much feature and future proof as possible. So we, uh, the user and the, the customer DLR and us can build on top of that uh, when the new requirements come. 
So we have started uh, working in uh, plant work in six six basic steps. First, the review of what was there and the requirements, then to map what was running on the platform and was required into the architecture we have designed for Earth observation platforms. Then analyze the data uh, of the requirements and the requirements for the integration with other sources and systems. Develop what is needed to develop and integrate, populate with data, migrate the users, launch the platform, and then begin the real work, which is support the users and evolve the, the system we, we have we have built. So before that, uh, the review of the documentation was not was not enough. They, they, there was of course tons of of of, uh, of good documentation on the existing design, but we also needed to understand a bit deeper how various things work, how some data is generated, some how some how some metadata or information in the system is built, how the uh, processing process looks like. So we needed even to dig into the code of code DE phase one to understand what is critical uh, for the for the future development. Uh, the the code DE platform is built on on something we 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 have designed as a common architecture for the ground segment um, data uh, processing and storage uh, sites. As Sashek has already uh, said in his part, it's starts with the storage and acquisition of data, then it is processing the data on demand and systematic, so the creation of, of additional products from the, from the satellite data, then unified indexing and access to the data. So these are three sections or three parts of such platforms, which we, which we, which we think fulfill most of the requirements uh, of, of ground segment data distribution. And processing platforms. So we took the code phase one design and tried to identify similarities and things that can we easily map into our own design. So first we took the whole data ingestion, so acquisition, processing, storage part, and mapped it into our own ingestion ingestion system, making sure that the same metadata, the same information is collected and exposed to, to other systems. Then we looked at the available interfaces and also made sure that the interfaces we, we deliver, the WMS, WMS data access, uh, the diagram might not be readable. <laughs> I am aware of that, sorry for that. <laughs> but in the, in the version we share, you will be able to read all those small letters. So believe me that these are similar things, marked in red, blue, and, and green. The, uh, the common part, was also the user interface. Of course, we, we needed to redevelop or redesign it to to, accom to answer the requirements. And the 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 part that was the, that experienced the biggest change was the processing part, because the, the phase one code D uh, used um, um, partially closed uh, cluster environment for processing and some part of public cloud for for additional uh, users uh, users um, processing but it was not in uh, flexible enough so we adapted to our design we choose as a common cloud infrastructure to do both processing of data and the users uh, users environments uh, Looking at the data, Michel has already uh, said about data offer. So what we wanted to make sure that everything that um, can be offloaded to the big storage in Warsaw, the Critia storage, and is not critical for Frankfurt, is accessible for the for the code users. That gives the users ability to access worldwide data, but without the need to uh, uh, use a lot of of um, or occupy a lot of storage in the in the in in the code the main site in in Frankfurt, so it in increases efficiency of data use a lot because as you can expect, users of of code are interested mostly in Germany, but from time to time they need to access global 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 data. 
Second, we need to we needed to develop some custom components, which are which were specific to code D. But thanks to our design, which is modular and scalable, we could do that. So we developed custom processors that create the convenience products that Michel has talked about. And we also created some additional functionalities like getting the, the data from the Copernicus contributing missions. And of course, we have developed uh, or redeveloped uh, user interfaces. So they are adapted to, to German users and, um, and focused on, on the area of, of Germany. So in the end, in the end, we have created a set of, of uh, user interfaces, including the portal, browser, finder, uh, the cloud management dashboard, the Jupyter Hub, and uh, last, uh, the data cube uh, management interface. So once we had the software, when we had the data processed or, or, uh, or ready to be processed, and what is important to say, we have been able due to the to the to using the same architecture we were able to very quickly process the whole uh, spatial and temporal coverage uh, of germany using the cap big capacity of the big cloud in in warsaw even before we have installed the servers that that the code e platform is using so we have deployed we have deployed storage which which is altogether more more than two petabytes uh, and um, available, uh, available data space for both the repository and the users, user storage. And um, currently more than two, um, two, two, petabytes, uh, two terabytes of, of uh, available RAM um, to, to, for the user um, cloud processing environments and for the platform internal processing. So once the system was deployed, the users migrated, which we managed to do overnight. So the old platform was disabled or um, disconnected on 31st of March, and the new platform was opera fully operational from the 1st of, of April uh, this year. Uh, so the users started coming, and currently we have um 1300 active users with almost 4000 users registered in the systems How, however some of the users that were using the previous platform did not did not my, decided to use the new one we hope they will come back and the data ingestion continues we add new collections we provide support in german and english with almost 300 support tickets already served and Every month brings a new feature or new functionality to be to be implemented. Uh, what are the lessons learned from from what we have been been doing? Been doing? First of first of first of all, we have we have uh, we have uh, we have um, confirmed that the design we have prepared and the solutions we built to answer the challenges of Earth observation processing platforms uh, have proven in both greenfield deployments, with which we have done before, like the Credius uh, platform and currently the LTA platform, and the brownfield migration platform, which, which in which we have not, we were, we could not design everything, but we needed to adapt it, uh, to the design that was already there, to the functionality that was already there. So that means the solution we, we've built, the tools we have created, are flexible enough to accommodate uh, most of the needs of, of the users with, uh, to be honest, very little modif modification required, uh, as we were able to do it in six months altogether. Uh, the standard tools we, we serve uh, we have served all the needs of uh, of air observation data processing because what the platform can do is it gets the data from the source which can be even very raw data from the satellite that then it can process it in real time to any kind of product possible then it can store um, extract any information and feature and present it to the user with the ability to, pro to pro for the user to process it locally and publish the results further. 
So it's a whole chain from the acquisition of the of the information from the orbit uh, up to uh, re, re use of the of that information in a in an easy to to understand form by the end user. Mm. Also, the cloud mm, cloud based processing um, is suitable both for systematic data processing. So the same infrastructure, the same the same the same computing power can be used to generate products uh, systematically. So we create the whole data sets and collections, like the mo German mosaics, for example. And also at the same time, it provides the users ability to work, deploy the containers, and do whatever they they want. And last but not, not least, the open source solutions we have chosen, uh, we have adapted, we have uh, fixed at times, uh, have proven to be reliable and scalable for the large scale deployments. Uh, the co co code the cluster is growing. Uh, we have already consumed most of it and we will be planning together with DLR on, on the further upgrades. And uh, the 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 um, Warsaw zone, um, which we call the the, the cluster available in in, uh, in Warsaw, has already passed the threshold of twenty petabytes of of, uh, of data stored in the stored in the in, in the repository, and well, I don't even remember how much how many virtual cores we make available to to the users. Uh, what is nice also the 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 um, public has recognized the effort we made and the and the, the work we have done uh, together with DLR and we were awarded um, for this work with uh, Polish German um, economical award uh, and um, award from the Polish uh, development uh, agency so it's not also not also a internal say success so we are happy that we made it and it works and, and the users are are um, are happy to to come and use it but also also other other um, experts think that that it, we did a good job so so thank, Rab, you. Uh, thank you Alec for for uh, for this we uh, will be wrapping up uh, we have uh, a lot of interesting questions that have been asked on the uh, chat before we proceed to the questions i will uh, give a few words uh, about uh, the current and uh, future developments so uh, one thing we are working so, so th this is what uh, you may expect from us uh, in the coming uh, months uh, we are working on a, on a processing as a service, uh, serverless uh, processing functionality uh, for the platform, since we, we think it is very convenient for users to, uh, to process in this uh, mode. It will be a function as a service oriented uh, and designed for uh, Earth data, uh, Earth observation data processing. Uh, another thing that we have uh, that is already operational uh, in the platform is the Earth observation, uh, the, the smart cache for uh, data. So uh, you can, for instance, uh, download and acquire high resolution data from uh, external platforms and have that data stored in a, uh, in a common uh, cache. Uh, which is uh, currently over a petabyte and this data this data cache is uh, free for users uh, by free we mean uh, it's free for users who use uh, uh, virtual machines or other processing on the platform they may uh, make use of this uh, cache uh, another thing uh, that we are uh, working in on is uh, better access to very high resolution data with uh, different uh, new data providers uh, coming in uh, with uh, very high resolution data. And another area we are working on is uh, dynamic data cubes. Uh, so, so this is the current and the future developments. Uh, we, from this, I would move quite uh, smoothly to the Q&A part. 
uh, we have got many uh, questions we will answer uh, try to answer all of them uh, if we don't answer them right now we will answer them uh, by uh, mail or uh, offline uh, with the with the users who uh, posted them uh, I will just pick a few questions uh, that we uh, we came across. Uh, one of them uh, is about new this new modern functionalities uh, I was talking about during the presentation, such as Kubernetes, Swarm, etc. Uh, so uh, some of these functionalities are already uh, on the platform. I mean Terraform, which was uh, the question was about the. You can uh, use uh, Terraform uh, with the OpenStack con connector right now on the platform and uh, we indeed have uh, a few customers who use it in, a, uh, in an extensive way uh, doing uh, dynamic provisioning. Uh, Kubernetes and uh, Swarm can, can be deployed manually right now but it is inconvenient for users and uh, supported version of Kubernetes uh, will be coming uh, by the end of uh, Q1 uh, uh, next year. Uh, so, so uh, in order to do this, we need to upgrade the OpenStack version we are running now. So we will be uh, doing precisely that, and and uh, we hope to make this available on the on the platform. Another question uh, that was asked was about the, infra the kind of infrastructure that uh, can be used uh, on the, uh, to, to process these uh, sizes of, uh, of data. Uh, so uh, this question was partly answered by the slide that Alec has shown uh, this one. Uh, precisely, this is uh, generally how we build our uh, our infrastructure. We use uh, large storage nodes with uh, with a huge uh, eight or ten terabyte uh, disks uh, and thirty of these in in one node. Uh, and for the storage cluster, we use uh, we use Ceph. Uh, which is an open, uh, which is an open source uh, distributed storage uh, cluster, uh, and uh, it, within the largest infrastructure we run, which is CreoDias, we have over 160 uh, storage uh, nodes right now. So it's it's really a, a, a huge uh, a, a huge uh, infrastructure. Another question uh, we that was asked was um, about the catalog. Uh, what? Uh, what? Uh, can yes, you, you can answer <laughs> this one. Yes, uh, uh, yeah. we. To be honest, we are using multiple cataloging uh, tools. Uh, the principal one is uh, is our um, custom built um, product database, which allows us to to manage all those uh, acquisition processes and and the data management. And from storing the metadata, we are using um, a tool called Resto, which is open search, um, um, open search compatible AP API. There are several others for other purposes, but these are the, the main. Yes, ones. Uh, and the Resto is an open source uh, mm -hmm. component. However, from, heavily modified by us. Uh, heavily modified by us. Yes, exactly. Uh, and I think that we had a question that that was uh, I think we would maybe, like maybe, maybe Mikhail a, to answer. Yes, uh, uh, about. But maybe before that, there was a question regarding the the DM data in Code D. We have several DM collections. There's the SRTM uh, DM, which I do not know, which is what is the resolution, and the Copernicus DM, which is 30 10, meters. 30, and 90 meters, depending on the on the sub sub collect sub collection. So you can you can go to the portal and look at the data offer, and there are uh, detailed descriptions of of the data sets. Uh, yes, and there was a question to to you, Michael. Do any German public administration entities have some kind of special access to Code? So if you would be so kind to, to answer this. Um, there's no special access in that sense. Um, same same rules account for everyone. Um, the German administration. Um, they can apply for certain quotas and uh, and use them. 
and other than that it's just the normal website and the apa api interfaces so um no no special treatment there okay thank you so okay. uh, I, I believe i have already answered uh, the question from christoph regarding the product catalog how long did it take to develop code the, the phase two as i said six months from from kickoff to 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 launch mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, oh next one interesting question how do you, how do user generated value added products uh, are made accessible to others including visualizations so there are, there are at least several paths first first one um uh, virtual machines and the cloud environment is connected to the internet so the user is free to set up any kind of data publishing um, application or, or utility and share the results with with the with the world or other users and second uh, the, all the data that is uh, properly structured and can be properly indexed can be published uh, on the plat Kodi platform itself as part of the of the data data offer this requires work together but is possible and, uh, and 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 it it is already being arranged with with several several uh, connections mm, what the i don't know how many questions you want to ask to uh, answer more i i think we we are running a bit out of time uh, okay so we will we will we will collect the the, the rest of the, the questions remaining and questions and answer them answer them, them uh, by, um, for all of you uh, to, to wrap up on this and to summarize, uh, we are very glad you uh, came uh, in such numbers to this, uh, to this uh, webinar. We hope it was interesting for you. If you plan on uh, doing uh, any more, uh, uh, any more uh, research on that or uh, if you plan on, uh, especially if you plan on uh, installing and having a, a, an Earth Observation uh, data processing platform if you have such a project. Uh, we will be uh, happy to uh, discuss it with you, uh, to share our insights. You can, you can uh, contact us uh, and, uh, um, and we will set up a, a, uh, a call with you and we, we can we can uh, discuss uh, those uh, aspects uh, so uh, I, I will um, end up and have to leave you with Alec for the end of this presentation thank you, thank you once again and uh, Alec will wrap up with the follow-up okay. uh, so thank you very much for attending the webinar uh, thank you very much, especially Michael, for for joining us and, and sharing your thoughts and presentation with us. I I, I hope in having you uh, gave uh, our participants a more complete view, not only on the technology and the, the platform, but also on the needs and and the requirements um, uh, users or or the, the customers may 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 have. Uh, would you like to? Do you say something? <laughs> okay. No, no, I'm. Uh, I was happy to be part of it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So it was a great pleasure to to host all of you uh, during the webinar. I hope you hope you like it. Uh, please uh, contact us by email or visit our website. Visit uh, the Code website, and I'm pretty sure uh, the LR staff will be will be also happy to. To, to talk to you about about your ideas and or needs uh, so please 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 visit Cody please visit Crudias please visit Cloudfero and I will hope I ho hope we will be able to help you with yours in the future thank you <laughs>